good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, colleagues. Um, very nice to see some people joining. We expect maybe there will be some more, but I'll start to introduce ourselves and this session. And then by the time everybody's joined, I guess we will be ready to go. Uh, so I'm Amanda Howe and I'm with Sankarad and Akumara of, uh, and we are the co-chairs of the Wonka Special Interest Group on Policy and Advocacy. Um, and we are together in Dublin at the Wonka Europe Conference, so uh, which is very nice and very exciting and good to be together. But we also thought it would be a very good chance to do a webinar with our colleague, uh, Professor Michael Kidd, partly so he's in the same time zone as us, so we're all here. Um, we're grateful we have uh, Mary doing a Spanish translation to support uh, people. If you want to listen with headphones to the Spanish channel, you go into the interpretation yes. tool and uh, you should be able to hear and see that. So hopefully that's an advantage. Um, and... I think I'm going to now hand over to Sanka to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. It's very nice to uh, be here in Dublin. Uh, it was a bright day today. Now it seems like it's becoming a bit gloomy, but still it's very nice uh, a day in Dublin with our colleagues. Um, uh, just to tell more about the interpretation, you can go to the interpretation icon and uh, switch on that and make it Spanish. So you can now hear everything in Spanish. Uh, so I'm very much thankful to Fabiola from uh, Bolivia, one of my colleagues and a young doctor from Wainakai Movement who agreed to be our Spanish translator. So thank you, Fabiola. And also uh, the other uh, language, uh, for other languages, like uh, any languages allowed uh, by Zoom, you can go to the show caption uh, option and you can just click that and you can select your language and you can see the captions from the language of your preference. So we have uh, the language equity here, Spanish live translation and many other languages. So thank you very much, uh, Michael, for joining us today uh, to talk about how to be an effective advocate with your government. Uh, Professor Michael Kidd, AO is Professor of Global Primary Care and Future Health Systems with the Nuffield Department of Primary Health Care Sciences and the University of, or at the University of Oxford and the Foundation Director of the International Center for Future Health Systems at the University of New South Wales. He was the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Australia during the COVID-19 pandemic and one, is, one of the main reasons for us to have him here today. And he has served as the president of World Organization of Family Doctors, that is Wonka, many of you know that, and also the president of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, and also chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto, Canada, chair of the Department of General Practice at the University of Sydney, dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at Flinders University and Foundation Director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on Family Medicine and Primary Care. And I can go on, but I stop here and hand it over to you, uh, Michael. Thank you, Sanka, and uh, thank you, uh, Amanda, as well. Thank you for inviting me to uh, join you all today. And, uh, and thank you, dear colleagues, for, for joining in. I'm just looking at the list of people who are participating. I think we've got people from every continent. Uh, and so a, a true Wonka global event. And of course, many people will also be watching this uh, as a video uh, after the event. So uh, a big thanks for the opportunity to come and, and talk to you about advocacy uh, as a family doctor. And as Sanka uh, said, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I served as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer uh, for Australia. I had responsibility for 
the primary care response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, but it also gave me a lot of insights into how government works. In fact, I wish I'd known previously what I know now about how government works. It would have made some of my other roles uh, much uh, easier and, uh, and would have made my own advocacy uh, more effective in the past. So I want to share with you some of the things that I've uh, learned and, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to take away some ideas uh, which will help you with your own advocacy. As uh, Sankar and Amanda said, uh, we're in Ireland uh, at the moment and uh, we're here for the uh, Wonka Europe uh, conference and here with many colleagues from uh, all around the world. Part of what we've been doing here uh, in, uh, in Dublin is paying tribute to this man. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Michael Boland, who passed away uh, a couple of years ago, who was president of Wonka uh, from 2001 uh, to 2004. And Michael was a real inspiration to many of us. He was a very effective family doctor advocate, both for family medicine in his own country in Ireland, where he was uh, past president of the Irish College of General Practitioners, but also very active as an advocate globally. And Michael was one of the people who started Wonka's advocacy work with the World Health Organization uh, back during his presidency, uh, made uh, sure that Wonka became uh, a recognized organization representing family doctors within the World Health Organization. And he was particularly effective in two areas. He focused on smoking cessation and the role of family medicine in assisting our patients uh, to stop smoking, uh, recognizing that tobacco use is a huge cause of much of the chronic illness that we see in family medicine and in our hospitals. And also he was very strong in advocating for the role of family doctors in providing care for people with HIV AIDS. Remembering that in the late 1990s, uh, we finally got triple therapy available, which made uh, HIV AIDS uh, from a inevitably terminal disease into a manageable chronic disease for those people who are fortunate enough to live in countries where they could get access to those medicines. And Michael recognized that HIV AIDS was now a primary care condition, which could lar largely be managed in primary care, but that we needed to educate uh, family doctors and uh, nurses and others working in primary care in order to be able to provide effective care to our patients. One of my favorite quotes from Michael is this one. He said in a reflective piece, what do people want from their doctor? They want a doctor who will listen, a doctor who is flexible, a doctor who will help me to sort out problems, and a doctor who will be there when I need her. And Michael in his advocacy taught me a very important lesson. And the lesson was that when going to talk to governments about the importance of family medicine in a country, it's very important to put it in the context of our patients and the service that we provide to our community. So not going up and saying, doctors need this, but saying in order to better meet the needs of our patients, in order to be have a better healthcare system in our country, here are the things that we need to do and support in family medicine. And there is a distinction uh, between the two. So I thought what I'd do is share with you uh, seven steps on how to be an effective advocate. And, uh, and I'll go through each of these seven points and uh, and just reflect on some advice, but also on some experience that I've had uh, in working in these different ways. So we'll dive right into the first one. So the first one is if you're gonna be an advocate, you need to understand the issue that you're talking about. So you need to have a degree of expertise uh, in the field that you want to advocate about, which means knowing your stuff having a deep understanding of the issue that you're advocating about. And that means knowing the facts, knowing who are the key stakeholders, but very importantly in your national context, knowing what are the current policies and the current legislation that relate to the issue that you're concerned about, because they will be the things that you'll be wanting to advocate to have updated 
or introduced or changed. Secondly, is to know the landscape. So know about the current healthcare policies, regulations, reforms, how things get changed in your uh, country, but also know where your government is currently investing. So have a look at the national budget from the last year or the last few years to see what are the priorities where government is investing in healthcare. And then understand how these policies and regulations and the budget investments are impacting on patients and the people who provide care to your patients and your healthcare system as a whole. I'll just remind people to please put yourselves on mute so we don't get any background. Yep, thank you. And the third thing is to stay up to date. So you do your homework, but then you've got to keep up to date with new developments, new research, new changes in healthcare laws and policies. Now, if you do all this, if you know your stuff, know the landscape, stay informed, then you have the opportunity to become an expert and someone who government is going to rely on for providing advice about a specific area of healthcare. And you may be invited to join a committee. You may be invited to testify to a government panel. You may be invited to go and meet with your minister or meet with members uh, of your uh, Department of Health or others. Um, and, uh, and so you build up your expertise over time. One way to become an expert, I discovered, was to become a professor. When I became a professor, all of a sudden overnight, people thought that I was wise. Um, I was no different to how I was the day before, but um, there's something about that handle uh, of being called professor in my country, in Australia, um, that all of a sudden you're regarded as being an expert. But of course, there are many experts who are not professors. You're experts on the healthcare issues affecting your local community as a GP working in that community. You're an expert on the education of the future general practice workforce because you're involved in teaching medical students or teaching registrars. You're an expert uh, if you're involved in research in the area that you're uh, involved with. So you don't need to be a professor in order to be an effective advocate. So that's the first issue. The second one is identifying the right audience for the message you want to get across. And so you need to know who makes decisions about healthcare in your national context. And this may be elected officials, the members of parliament. It may be the members of government agencies, the Department of Health, different agencies set up by your government. So the, uh, the bureaucrats, the policymakers who sit in those government departments. It may be people who sit on uh, committees which are providing advice uh, to government as well. So need to know who the people are and then work out who do you need to try and uh, connect with in order to get your message across. My advice is, uh, particularly with general practice issues, is to focus on government ministers, whoever is the minister of health in your country, but also on the public servants, the bureaucrats, who are the people who provide advice to the minister, but then the minister will say, go away to those people and make the policy recommendations. So they will work on the policy, they will bring together the evidence, um, and they'll put policy forward to the minister for the minister's consideration. Now, they're not the same. The minister and the public servants, they're not the same, and they need different approaches. And we'll talk about different approaches for each. I find that with ministers, often what they really like is stories about patients which tug at their heartstrings. So stories which make them uh, feel emotional, stories which provide them with an example of if they did this, they would make a big difference in the life of this child or this person or this older uh, adult. So, you're, But you also need to understand what are the priorities of the ministers that you're approaching. And you can find out what their priorities are by seeing what are the positions they're holding in government. What are their past voting records? What are the statements that they've made about family medicine or general practice? Do a Google search about quotes uh, from the minister and find out what they've had to say before. And then if you get the chance to talk to the minister, you can say, minister, now I know in a speech that you gave um, back in 
August, um, you had a particular focus on this. And one thing you said that I found really interesting was, and quote something uh, from that talk, it shows that you've done your homework, you know what the minister is interested in. I did get asked a question um, at the Wonka conference today about approaching governments uh, who are right wing or left wing and if it's a different approach. And, you know, for, fortunately, governments, whether they're left wing, right wing or in the middle, uh, are interested in health care. And most governments are interested in making sure that everybody in the country has access uh, to high quality health care. So healthcare messages are often very similar, uh, even with uh, politicians who sit at different ends of the political spectrum. But it's still important to know what are the things which uh, motivate and drive the individual politician. Uh, the public servants, the bureaucrats, um, they're less interested in stories and more interested in solutions to the challenges that they're responsible for. And so I find it's particularly helpful when you're meeting with a public servant uh, to go in with this approach to say, I am someone who can help you and ask them, you know, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing and, and what are the ways in which I can help? And then they will tell you, well, what we're dealing with at the moment is the challenge of providing primary care to everybody, but particularly to people from this particular group or in this particular region of the country or whatever it might be. So do you have any advice on how we can do that? So it's also um, a clever way to find out what their priorities are by instead of going in and saying, you know, I've decided your priority should be this, say to them, what are the big challenges that you're facing? What are your priorities? Okay, and here are some ways that I can help you. Uh, in addressing that. And often what you'll find is the big challenges which are facing your ministers and your public servants will be the same things that you want to advocate for. You know, the, the biggest challenges we have are around equity, equity of access to healthcare, equity from the outcomes of healthcare. We have a big challenge in ensuring that healthcare is available to everybody, no matter who they are, uh, where they live in the country, um, what, uh, what cultural groups they belong to. So, you know, often these are the big challenges which governments are facing and they're things that we have solutions for. And then if you do say you're going to help with something, actually follow through. And my advice is if you get a meeting with your minister or with a public servant and you say you will do something, follow up by email by the end of that day. So get an email back saying, dear minister, thank you for meeting with me today. In our meeting, you asked for some further evidence or advice on the following and provide that evidence or advice. And my advice is to do it straight away uh, so that by the end of the day, the minister or the public servant has your advice in front of them because politicians and public servants are very busy people. And often if you leave it till tomorrow, they will have forgotten about meeting with you because since then they've met with many more people. It's a bit like, I don't know if you find this in general practice, but sometimes you get to the next day and you go, I can't remember some of the patients I saw yesterday because I saw so many and now I'm seeing a whole lot more. For politicians and for public servants, it's the same. So if you want to have an impact, get your messages, get your evidence, get what you promised to provide in front of them and then say, um, if there's more that I can provide, uh, please let me know. Uh, I will, I'm planning to reach back out to you uh, in another month um, with uh, more evidence to support the work that you're doing. The third uh, big uh, area of, of ad advocacy is building relationships. Now, it takes time to build relationships and you may not have a lot of time. If you're elected as president of your college or society, um, you may only have a year or two years uh, to be an effective advocate. But if your college or society has an advocacy group, uh, has people who are doing policy work among the, um, among the uh, staff of the college, work with those people uh, and, uh, and work with them on here are the areas that I want to focus on while I'm president of the organisation. The chances are they'll have done a lot of work already. They will know who to talk to. If you don't have that sort of resource available to you, then you're going to have to do it yourself. 
And relationships do take time uh, and need to be nurtured, just like our personal relationships. Uh, it takes time to build a relationship and to nurture that relationship. So often the first time you meet a minister, it may be just about getting to know you um, and saying, you know, here are the things I feel passionate about. Here are the areas I'd like to work with your minister. And then it may be the next time you see the minister that you say, you know, here are the things that I want to advocate for with you and what we need to do. Um, but put yourself in a position where you can have some influence. So my advice is to volunteer to serve on government committees, working with public servants, reporting to ministers. Um, I've been working on government committees uh, in Australia uh, for nearly 35 years, uh, from when I was a junior doctor and my college uh, said, would you, to me, would I go and serve on a, a committee um, uh, providing advice to the Australian government uh, on the use of computers in general practice. And uh, I said, look, I'm, you know, I've never done that before. Am I the right person to do it? And the person who asked me said, yep, you're, you're a young doctor. You're the face of the future of general practice. Um, we want them to be hearing from young doctors about how this new technology is going to transform uh, healthcare. Well, I'm no longer a young doctor, but I still uh, I'm in the position now to encourage other young doctors to take up those opportunities. Um, and if you have the opportunity to serve in a committee uh, providing advice to your government, do it uh, and be an active member of that, that committee. And through doing that, other opportunities will come forward. Um, so over time, build those relationships with policymakers and with their staff and build that regular communication in. Uh, if you can, uh, get the email address for the minister's advisors, for the public servants, uh, if you can get their phone number, and if something comes up that you think they need to know about, you can send them a quick uh, SMS text, um, link it to a document, uh, and make sure that they're up to date. And this way, they'll think, yeah, she's really helpful. Here's someone we can work with. And when they hear from you, they're more likely uh, to take your request uh, for a meeting or for a discussion. And very importantly, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And by this, I mean, if you build up a relationship with a minister or with a policymaker over time, make sure it's a respectful relationship both ways. And if you have to say something in the media, which is counter to what the government is doing, and that often happens, do it in a way which is respectful and is not personally attacking the minister or the public servant. If you bite the hand that feeds you, um, nobody is going to feed you again. Uh, so, um, and I've, I've seen this as a policymaker. Uh, we've had a relationship with the head of a medical organization who has then come out in the um, in the press and has said really harsh, personal, nasty things about the minister. Well, the minister won't want anything to do with that person ever again. And so they've destroyed the relationship that they've built over time. There are ways to disagree with your government in a respectful manner. So, and, you know, you can say that by, you know, we notice the government has, has come forward with this policy uh, we're very concerned that this policy won't necessarily meet the needs of all patients in the community in particular. We think these groups are going to miss out. Uh, we're keen to work with the minister on revising and updating the policy so that it meets the needs of everybody. You know, there are ways of getting your message across in a way that is positive and constructive. And if you do talk to the media about your minister, it's a good idea to let your minister know that you've done that interview so that they can be prepared if the journalists come to them and ask them for their contrary view to what you've said. So I have a rule in uh, advocacy, which is no surprises. So they shouldn't, people shouldn't be surprised about what happens. Number four is about the importance of using evidence and using data in your advocacy. So as a family doctor, you are a clinician scientist. You use science in your daily work, 
providing care and advice to your patients. So we expect you when you come forward to advocate for an issue to use evidence and to have available data available to present and to share. And uh, politicians and policymakers, they love charts and graphs showing how things are, are progressing over time. They particularly love charts and graphs which show improvements since they came into power. Um, but uh, you can, you've got to be honest, you know, if things are on the decline, um, you can show that as well. And then you show why it is that you want to do the particular intervention to make a difference. So solid evidence and solid data can really help you make a compelling case, but also show that your position is well researched and credible. And so gather your evidence uh, to support your position, but also as well as using data and research findings, also bring in those real life examples, which may come from your own patients, from your own clinic, or from your own community. As I mentioned earlier on, ministers love to hear about real life examples of where there's a problem and how changes in government policy uh, can help to make a difference. So have both the data prepared, but also have those real life examples to share uh, with your uh, with your policymakers as well. And what you may want is statistics on healthcare outcomes. You may want information about the costs of healthcare, particularly powerful if you can produce something which shows that the intervention that you want to recommend is going to save money for your healthcare system. Every healthcare system in the world is facing challenges with increasing costs and increasing demand. And what we know is that if we can move health services out of hospitals, into the community, move the resources and the personnel into general practice and family medicine, build up the services we're providing in the community, we can provide a lot more service for a lot more people at a lot less cost, and in a way which is probably going to be more effective, more efficient, uh, and more equitable uh, for the population. So being able to show that to your ministers and your policymakers can be very powerful messages uh, to get across. And the other thing is often governments will call inquiries to look into aspects of uh, healthcare uh, in your country and find out about those inquiries. There may be um, a weekly update from your uh, from your government about government inquiries. If there is, uh, subscribe to that so it comes in each week and you can see what's happening. And if an inquiry comes out, make sure you make a submission. You can make a submission from your college or society. You can make a submission as an individual concerned um, citizen. And also request, if you make a submission, the ability to appear in front of the inquiry and provide a verbal statement and to answer the questions from the inquiry as well. It's a great way to build your profile because often the media uh, will be looking at these inquiries as well. So they will quote the evidence that you've uh, provided, but also it's a way to get you in front of the politicians uh, who you may not have met before uh, and who will then uh, draw on you as a source of uh, advice and wisdom uh, in the future. Uh, don't be frightened about appearing in front of uh, inquiries. If they invite you, they're inviting you because you're an expert. You're an expert as a family doctor. You're an expert about what's happening in the community. They want to hear from your experience as a family doctor about what are the issues um, that they're addressing. So recent inquiries that I've been involved with, I testified uh, twice to an Australian inquiry looking at the responses uh, to COVID-19. I've uh, been involved uh, in inquiries uh, looking at um, banning uh, vaping uh, as uh, a way of uh, uh, encouraging children to become addicted uh, to nicotine. I've uh, been involved in inquiries uh, looking at improving the safety and quality of healthcare, all sorts of different areas um, which, uh, which you might like to get involved with. The fifth is having got an opportunity to talk to a politician or to talk to a public servant, you need to prepare your message. And you've, you'll have a lot of data, a lot of evidence, a lot of stories, 
you need to take that and turn it into a nice, clear, concise and compelling message and, uh, and focus that message on how the changes and policies will improve things for patients and for the healthcare system. My advice is don't go in and say, if you change this policy, it'll make life better for doctors because that turns politicians and policymakers off. If you go in and say, if you make this change in policy, it will make improvements for the people of our country, for the way people get access to health care. It'll make access to family doctors um, more equitable, more affordable, uh, because the government is subsidizing those services uh, to a greater degree than they may be at the moment. It'll make family doctors able to uh, have the income to afford to employ nurses and others uh, to help to boost the number of people we've got to deliver care uh, to the patients in the system. I hope you can hear there that, you know, it's turning it away from, you know, give us more money into family medicine to how can we work with you as governments to build and strengthen primary care, invest more into primary care to deliver better care to our patients and to the people of our nation. And so getting your message across, be specific about what you're advocating for, be succinct and avoid jargon. So in medicine, we use a lot of jargon. As family doctors, we tend to use less because we're used to talking to our patients and explaining things. But don't use abbreviations, don't use acronyms. If you have a, uh, an acronym like Wonka, say the World Organization of Family Doctors, um, spell things out because you can't assume that everybody knows what every um, abbreviation or acronym actually means, uh, especially in people working with other areas. And have your messages ready as what I would call an elevator pitch. So I don't know if you've ever got into an elevator, a lift, and there's been someone famous standing in the elevator with you, and you desperately want to say something to that person. What is it that you would say to that person? And what if that person who's in the elevator with you is the Minister for Health? You never know when you might find yourself with the Minister of Health of your country with five minutes or two minutes to get across an important message. So always be ready with that elevator pitch. And I'll tell you a true story uh, from my own experience. So I turned up to work in my general practice one Saturday morning, and there was one patient waiting for me in the waiting room, and it was Australia's Minister for Health. And I did a double take when I walked in and looked and saw it's the minister sitting in my waiting room who was not one of my patients. They were visiting my city and happened to need to see a doctor and someone had recommended they come to our clinic. So uh, I went and introduced myself and invited the minister into uh, my consulting room. I uh, said, what can I do for you today, minister? We addressed the issue uh, that the minister had. Uh, I was holding uh, the prescription and I said, is there anything else I can do for you, Minister? And the Minister said, no, that's everything. I said, great, there are a few things you can do for me. And I uh, said, I just can't, have you got a couple of minutes so we can just talk about some of the challenges facing uh, general practice in Australia? Uh, and, you know, you're here in our practice. I'd just like to show you um, how, we're, how we have some real challenges and how uh, I think we might be able to address some of those. And, uh, and then, uh, so the minister very politely listened, and then I gave the minister their prescription. Uh, and then I, I said, you know, um, would it be possible to follow up with one of your advisors or one of your staff on some of the things we've talked about? And so the minister gave me um, the, the contact details for one of their advisors, and I followed up by the end of that day. Uh, saying to the uh, the advisor, I, I met with the minister earlier uh, today, we discussed this issue and here are some of the things that I promised to share uh, with the minister. So always be ready and always have that elevator pitch ready. So how do you craft an elevator pitch uh, to be ready in case you find yourself with the minister or someone else who may be of influence? You've got however many floors they're going to. So watch and see which button they push, and then you know how much time you've got to get your message across. It may be two minutes, it may be 
uh, more than that, depending on how tall the building is and how far up they're going. But get across, introduce yourself. Minister, hello, my name's Professor Michael Kidd. What do you do? Uh, I'm the president of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. What do you want? You know, while we've got a couple of minutes, can I just share with you a couple of things which are really concerning our members about the care that we're able to provide uh, to our patients in Australia? The call for action. Um, here are the two issues. And can I follow up with one of your staff? And then when the minister gets out of the lift, you get out of the lift too. Uh, and just, you know, uh, get the details for their chief of staff or whoever it is, and they can get back in the lift and go to whatever floor you're going to. Um, so, you know, be ready with those uh, elevator pitches um, and never be shy about going up and approaching a politician or a public figure uh, who you happen to see uh, in a public space, in an airport, um, in a restaurant, I wouldn't do it in a public bathroom, but uh, you know where, wherever they might be, um, go up and say hello. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, I find it, it it can be very genuine to actually say to a politician, especially the Minister of Health, Minister, thank you for the work that you're doing for the people of Australia. I know how hard uh, the job of being Minister for Health is. Here are some ways that I think that we can help you to do an even better job. Uh, for our, our nation. Number six is about getting the public involved in your advocacy work. Uh, one of the things that we know as family doctors is our greatest advocates for the work that we do as family doctors is our patients. And so identify who among patient groups, especially consumer groups, uh, may be people who will support the position that you have and the advocacy that you want to do. And indeed, if you do get to go and see a minister, it may be helpful for you to go as a family doctor with a representative of a patient advocacy group. If you want to go and talk to the minister about improving the care of people with diabetes through general practice, take someone from the National Diabetes Group. And that way you'll get an even better hearing and that person can provide some of those heartstring tugging examples uh, which, uh, which get the minister uh, thinking and get them involved and engaged. Uh, you can also get public support through campaigns and petitions and forums. These are the sort of things that you might uh, help to lead run if you become elected as president uh, of your national college or society of family medicine. Um, that strong public backing can put increased pressure on politicians and policymakers to pay attention to your cause. Uh, in countries where there's an annual health budget brought down by the government, um, you may want to produce your own report on what you think should be in the budget and get that in, in front of the policymakers very early. Share it with the media. Talk to the media about why you think these things are important to be funded by government and how they're going to make an improvement uh, in the care of people in your country. As family doctors, as I mentioned, our most effective advocates are our patients and the communities that we serve. And, and our advocacy, I think, should be framed as much as it can be around here's what we can do to support patients and support the communities where we're involved. Public speaking, doing this advocacy with the public may involve getting out and talking to the media, uh, giving speeches, uh, talking on the radio, talking on the television, using uh, social media. One of the things about being a leader of a family doctor group is you will need to do public speaking. If you are not comfortable about public speaking, then get some training and get some practice about talking in public, about getting your messages across. And always remember that when you are talking about an issue, you're the expert on that topic because you've done all that homework in the previous uh, list of issues that I've talked about. You've prepared your messages, you've done your homework, you know who you wanna get your message across to, you've got the data at your fingertips, you know the research, you know the statistics, and you've got some great uh, stories to tell about uh, patients and about how what you're advocating for can make a real difference. So if you're not comfortable doing public speaking, try and get some training in doing public speaking and talking with the media. This is an example that I've had of public speaking when I was 
uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Australia. Uh, I had to, a couple of times a week, go and talk to the uh, the media about what was happening with COVID-19 in our country. One of my staff in the health department would film me and then that would be uploaded onto Facebook and uh, Twitter or X and other platforms. Uh, one day, uh, the staff member rang me all excited saying, uh, over the last two hours since you did your press conference, you've had over 2 million views uh, all around the world. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. 2 million people looking at my press conference. Uh, I wonder what I said that was so interesting and important. So I went to have a look at it. And what I found was that she had filmed me upside down. And uh, the press conference had gone around the world and it was going viral with people sharing. Here's the press conference from the, uh, the, the doctor from COVID doctor from down under delivering his press conference. So thinking, you know, we, we talk upside down. So you can uh, get out there. The message wasn't important there. It was, uh, it was just the, uh, the novelty factor uh, at a time of, of great distress, of course, for many people. So my final message is about using the media and using the media to get your advocacy messages across. And of course, nowadays, we use traditional media, radio, television, print, uh, giving speeches, as well as social media to raise awareness and to build support. And uh, if you are president of your organization, you hopefully will have someone leading communications who can help to work with both the traditional media and the social media to get your messages out. Uh, to the public uh, and hopefully to raise the profile with uh, governments and the policymakers as well. Uh, an op-ed is a, an editorial piece uh, which is uh, contributed by uh, authors uh, to, usually to newspapers. You may have the editorial page where uh, the newspaper writes its own editorials. On the other side, on the opposite side, they may have uh, editorials from members of the public, usually influential people, wanting to get an important message across. So you may want to use that as a way of getting a message across. It's a great way to do so. Those op-eds also go into social media uh, so they can be picked up uh, uh, by people uh, around the country and around the world. Press releases, if you've got a message you want to get across, craft a press release, make yourself available for interviews. Uh, by radio or by television uh, or uh, with the, uh, the print media. Uh, social media, you may be invited to be on webinars like this one uh, or uh, on people's blogs or other ways of getting uh, messages out to wider audiences. One of the most important things in working with the media is to be very conscious about your image, your image as a respected family doctor, a member of the community, someone who is passionate about healthcare, someone who is passionate about improving healthcare for everybody in the community. So build your image over time and don't do anything to damage your image. Um, we see this every day. People get involved in scandals. They do silly things. They get caught out doing uh, things they shouldn't do. And that totally destroys their image. Uh, you need to maintain your integrity in everything that you do. And as a family doctor, as a leader in family medicine, you've got to be very conscious uh, about not doing anything to damage your image. Because if you damage your image, you'll be damaging the image of our whole profession. So don't do anything to damage your integrity. So working with the media, we'll just finish with some advice on working with the media. Um, my advice is not to take cold calls uh, on the, uh, on the uh, phone. Uh, but to uh, if you see a, a phone number, um, let it go through to voicemail and then listen to the message. Um, find out, then contact the journalist, find out the background to the issue, ask them to email you the details. It may be a, a new journal article or something you haven't seen. Find out their deadline and then make a commitment to call them back within a agreed time frame. I usually won't provide a comment straight away because I want to do some research uh, and to think about the responses that I want to give. So hang up and then prepare your response. Prepare three messages and write them down that you want to get across and three things that you won't say. And then have a practice, either talking out loud to the mirror or talking to a friend 
and then call back that journalist within the agreed time frame and do the interview. But stay focused on the messages that you want to get across and don't necessarily get drawn into the sort of controversial areas that the journalist may want to draw you into. You don't have to provide a response to a journalist just because they ask you a question. You can say, that's a very interesting question and give the answer that you want to get across, the message that you want to get across um, to that journalist. Uh, so beware of beat ups. The media love to get conflicts, he said, she said, uh, and that may not be part of your image. Your image may not be someone who goes in and attacks other people, attacks the minister, attacks other doctors. Um, so be careful about what you say and be careful about how you say it. So just uh, I'll stop there. This is um, a little message from me for, for Wonka and for the great work that uh, Amanda and Sankar and the other members of the Policy and Advocacy Working Group are doing. Uh, one thing I've learned throughout my career is we have a lot of influence as family doctors to make real positive changes in our community by working together. And so my, I would encourage you not just to work on your own in this, but to work together with your colleges, work uh, and your colleagues uh, to try and make the change that you want to see uh, to improve things for your patients and the people of your nation. And we'll stop there. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Sanka. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, that was a very rich, comprehensive um, presentation. Hopefully, colleagues will be able to post the recording, but maybe also the slide set so that people could, if you, we can share it, if you don't mind, that would be really good. Um, we haven't got ever so long till the end of the webinar, but we've got a couple of comments. Um, one, well, Jeff's given us a quick and, you know, clever little you know, think who, what, why, and when, how, and where, and who sort of short list, which is clever. But um, I, you know, while we've been here, people have been saying, well, that's really great, but how do we as family doctors have the capacity to do this? And certainly I think, you know, hopefully some of our Wonka members will be putting resources into um, having people to help with that kind of homework you were talking about, you know, getting the background to policies, you know, finding out who the civil servants are, putting together some documents so that because as an individual, it's pretty hard to do what you've suggested without some support. And then Monica's also asked a question saying, you know, well, given that there's a long journey usually between even if a minister and a government accept a policy, to actually get it into um, practice, into implementation? And have you got any advice on how to keep a hold of that and keep some traction on the uh, issues? So, please. Yeah, so great, great questions. Thanks, thanks colleagues. Um, I think that one of the things I learned very early in my career, uh, advice from one of my early mentors was to pick your passions. So you can't do everything. Uh, so just be work out what is what is the area that you want to make a difference in. And it may be around education of the future family doctor workforce, or it may be about getting more investment in primary care research, or it may be about planetary health or preventive health care or smoking cessation or whatever it might be. One of those lessons from Michael Boland right from the start, he picked two areas to be passionate about helping people to stop smoking and improving the care of people around the world with HIV AIDS. So two clear areas to be involved with and then putting your attention into those areas. You can't do everything. Now, if you become elected as president of your college, you'll be expected to uh, be involved in lots of things, but hopefully you'll have support to do that. And you'll have members of your college who are the experts in those field, fields who can come with you for the meeting about whatever the topic uh, might be. And you're there as the representative, but here's the expert uh, on, the, on the topic. Um, the, uh, the other issue is about the long journey. So this is about building relationships over time. As I mentioned, I've been serving on government committees in Australia now for 35 years, uh, providing advice uh, to ministers over that time. And I have seen, Monica, many ministers come and go. But I've also seen 
ministers come back. So one of the junior ministers I worked with in 2008, uh, when I was leading Australia's National HIV AIDS uh, Committee, uh, we had a junior minister who I worked with and we did a lot of work together, who is now, uh, his government lost power, they were out of power for many years, they got back into power, he's now the Minister of Health. So, yes. you know, I have this enduring relationship uh, over time. So it's why I said relationships take time. The building of relationships uh, takes time. And this is a long-term uh, game, if you like, if you want to have uh, influence over time uh, in, uh, in your own country or in a, in a global context. Great. Thank you. Sanka, is there anything that you would like to comment on or uh, ask? Um. Uh, one thing I want to ask is, uh, uh, Michael, you told about this uh, not biting the hand that feeds you. I completely agree with you because the consequences would be very uh, sort of referent after that. But how can we keep our or maintain our integrity while uh, not going against in that way? But uh, how can we maintain our integrity as a person? Or a professional, while when when something like this uh, happens or some issue arises, it's really important, Sanka. So you know, as I mentioned, your integrity is incredibly important. Now, you can disagree with someone else, but you can disagree in a respectful way, and we do this all the time. You know, we disagree with colleagues, we disagree with uh, family members, we disagree with patients, we disagree, uh, and, and we do it in a respectful way, which doesn't destroy a relationship. We say, look, I respect your point of view, but I think, I think you're wrong. I think that this is what actually needs to happen. And based on this evidence, this data, these examples are from what happens in practice. Um, you can do that in a disrespectful way by saying, you know, the minister is an idiot. The minister doesn't know what he or she is talking about. Um, if you do that and you get quoted in the media, that minister will never talk to you again. They'll go, that's not someone I want to work with. That's not someone I'm going to uh, talk to. They're highly disrespectful. Um, if you do a, a difficult interview with a journalist and you think they're setting this up to make it look like I'm being disrespectful to the minister, hang up, contact the minister's uh, Chief of Staff, so I've just done an interview. The journalist was very antagonistic, very negative about the minister, was trying to get me to say negative things. Uh, I avoided doing that, but I do want to warn you that I'm worried this journalist might twist things. So mm -hmm. you get in first before the minister reads it on the front page of the paper or on their social media uh, feed. Um, there may be times, though, that you totally disagree with your government. So, you know, sometimes a government will get into power and they are doing terrible things for, um, which impact the people of your country. You may not be able to work with that government. You may just have to decide, I'm sorry, I can't work with this government. Um, you know, I'll do all I can to get a government elected that I actually can uh, work with uh, in the future. So, you know, unfortunately for some of our colleagues, they may find themselves uh, in that situation. Um, it's similar at a global level. You know, when we go for Wonka to the WHO, you know, often we will go, oh, you know, I, some of these policies are just crazy. You know, they're, they're anti-doctor. You know, they, they're, they're treating doctors as being an enemy of the healthcare system rather than the backbone uh, of the healthcare system. And so, you know, you want to try and build a relationship with people to get them to actually understand what happens in healthcare, because often they're operating from very limited experience in whatever country they've come from, uh, or they have a totally uh, unusual um, approach uh, to healthcare. And, you know, part of, again, it's building relationships over time, Amanda and I, we've been working with colleagues in the WHO now for decades um, and uh, and building those relationships over time. Thank you. Thank you. We're, uh, Dr. Aziz from Egypt just made an interesting comment in the chat, which in a way I don't think is a, is a question saying that, you know, when you have a government that is 
starting to be open to universal health coverage and primary care debates, then, you know, you have a door you can push on. But we as family doctors need to be prepared to speak up and show them what that pivotal role can mean. Um, and then another colleague, Dr. Noel Laksamana, says, Professor Kidd, I'm going to make this one the last one. How can I persuade my local chief executive, mayor, governor, who has his own health agenda, his own health agenda, to align with national health priorities? So I take that to be like, well, if the government's saying they want growing capacity in primary care with family doctors at the heart of it, you know, let's do it locally. How can we do that? Absolutely. Both both great questions. Uh, for Dr. Aziz, um, this is all about building capacity in family medicine. So you need to have a strategy, a strategy about how to get more uh, experience from medical students in family medicine, more training of uh, young doctors to become family doctors, more recognition of family doctors as being an important specialty in your country and, uh, and uh, parity of uh, payment and employment conditions for family doctors and other specialists, uh, the incentives for people to set up and run family practices. So you need to have a, a strategy. There's lots of resources available through Wonka, including through the Wonka guidebook. Uh, on how to do this. So, and if you can't find that, just reach out to me or Amanda or Sanka and we'll let you know. Uh, the final message is about people with their own agenda. This is really challenging. You know, I learned very early on from a policymaker that she who has the money has the power. So if someone's got the money, they've got the power. So you need to appeal to the, um, uh, appeal to the, the better nature of that person, appeal to appeal to them. Unfortunately, you're not going to win if that person is a narcissist or a psychopath or is Machiavellian in the way that they work. These are the people you can't win with. You, you then, if, if that's what they're like, focus somewhere else, focus your attention and don't waste your energy uh, and efforts. But if there's someone who is reasonable uh, and just is is thinking down one line or they have advisors who, you know, maybe all their advisors are nurses and they think nurses are the answer to everything. They're an answer to an awful lot, but not to everything. Um, you need to see what you can do to get some messages across. But uh, look, I wish, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you all today. And I wish you all every power with your advocacy work. And if I can provide any of you with any advice uh, offline, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find me uh, through my university connections. Well, thank you too, Michael, and thank you everybody who's joined. And please spread the word if uh, you know you think this has been useful. Tell your colleagues to look out for it on the membership portal. If you've got other feedback for me and Sankar about what other webinars you'd like to see or ideas for the special interest group, please contact us again through the portal or on email. Um, I think our next webinar, we're hoping to have another one before the end of the year, um, possibly with our current president, President Karen Flegg, who again is getting lots of new experience of advocating at a, another level. But we also want to do things with, you know, more local representation. So we'll keep looking for speakers and ideas. Um, and in the meantime, go well and all the best with your very important work. You know, that's the place where we really show what we can do is with our patients. So thank you, everybody. And um, Sanka? That's it. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for your insightful talk. And uh, I think it's very, very useful. And thank you, colleagues, for being with us. And special thanks to um, Mary Fabiola, Fabi from uh, Bolivia uh, for the Spanish translation and this will, will be available uh, on Wonka YouTube. Diamond will uh, make sure that it happens. So goodbye from uh, Dublin. Uh, see you again. Bye.